Get to an Ajo with a trailing Jarvis. Let's see what they can do. Jarvis plays give and go with Genso. Genso back to Jarvis. What a gorgeous goal. And Jarvis has extended his own lead. 2-0 Carolina. Genso factors in again. Wow. Wow. Dimitri Kuznetsov. Tenacious, and I swear Natchez, after he blew it by Sorokin high to the glove, just did the wings. I swear he just did the wings. He's been known to call, collect after he scores, but I thought after that gorgeous pass on that clean entry from Kuznetsov, Natchez blows it by Sorokin on the glove, and then he had the wings that Evgeny is known for. Welcome to the Canes Corner Podcast. I am Adam Gold. Who calls collect? Come on, people. Does anybody call Collect anymore? No. Nobody calls Collect anymore. How is everybody? Welcome to the Canes Corner Podcast. Thank you very much for spending some time with us. Whether you are in California, uh, Adelaide, Perth, Virginia Beach, Alaska, Hawaii, doesn't matter. Uh, we're all uh, we're all cool to be here after a 4-1 Hurricanes win over the New York Islanders. Small stuff. Hurricanes, even the season series with New York, this was the best of their performances against the Islanders. Uh, Pyotr Kachetkov, who had struggled against New York, and we'll give you those numbers in a minute, um, was excellent when he had to be, solid in all other all other facets, struggled a little bit with the puck very early in terms of handling the puck, very early, but uh, backed off that a little bit and was otherwise... Uh, I think very good. Lots to discuss here. Uh, thank you very much. And of course, we're brought to you by the Aluminum Company of North Carolina. If it is for the exterior of your home, you can find it at the Aluminum Company of North Carolina on Hamlin Road in Durham. No place like it. Sammy Hannon and his crew do a great job. And I uh, hope you check him out for all of your exterior home improvement needs. By the way, where, where is it? If you're, uh, if you're wondering and you're watching on YouTube Live, and we always hope you'll join us on YouTube Live, the um, that is the the carpet. This is from the Dig In with Trip collection, and this is in honor of Sebastian Ajo, uh, Carolina's second star of the game. In my opinion, did not get a star in the building, but uh, I guess he only had the one assist. Nature scored a goal, so he gets a star. Uh, Sebastian Ajo was mwah, chef's kiss outstanding tonight the kind of a game that you go it doesn't matter if he only had the one assist and that was on the empty net goal if you watched you saw what 20 did to both of the islanders top scoring lines because it looked like patrick wall was trying to figure out which matchup he wanted against aho neither of them worked aho gensel jarvis dominant tonight in every possible measurable way, they were dominant tonight. Uh, so, all right, here's what we're uh, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some things that we saw, a little bit about the game. Honestly, it was one of those games where Carolina, I thought, in the second period, was there at their best. I thought there were very few scoring opportunities for the Islanders. I know what the head coach said. He called it an even game. I think here's what we, what I've uh, been able to kind of gather from Rod. When the game is over, the game is over. He is not going to say, yeah, we kicked their rear end. We, we put their blank in the dirt. He's not going to do that. So he'll always point out when a team was missing somebody, he will always say, well, yeah, it was an even game. That was not an even game. That second period, Carolina's, I mean, absolutely suffocated the Islanders. They didn't get a goal, which is the weird part. And there were opportunities to get a goal early in the second period. But they didn't. Weird thing is, I think Carolina was better in the second than they were in the first, except at the end of the first period, they got all their goals. It was not a great first period for Carolina. First 12 minutes, I thought the Islanders controlled the play. They were the more dangerous team. But then Seth Jarvis scored once, and then Seth Jarvis scored twice, and then the Islanders went to bed right before the end of the period with Carolina on the power play and end-to-end -end rush. Uh, I think it was Shea to Kuznetsov who gave the puck to Natchez as he brought it across the blue line. 
and somehow there were four Islander defenders there that nobody bothered. I mean, what is 88 going to do? Except snipe one over the blocker side shoulder of your goaltender. If I were an Islander fan, that was the goal that would have made that would have completely finished my night. I would not have come back for the second period after that. All right. Uh, let's, uh, Vince appreciating the dig in garb. Absolutely. Um, I thank trip. Uh, I thank trip for this. All right. So let's go, let's kind of run down some of the things I wanted to talk about here. And this will be specific to the night and also overall. And we all knew, and Rod told me before the game, I think it was against, it was either against the Rangers or before the game against Florida. And I talked to him before every game and just a little inside baseball for some of you who don't know, otherwise know if I, because I'm sure I've mentioned it before. But for most home games, because I don't get a chance to go down to the skate in the morning. And frankly, right now, they're barely ever skating in the morning of a game. They didn't. They didn't practice yesterday, nor did they have a morning skate today. So the last time they played was Sunday in Ottawa, which is fine. Uh, and, as, and maybe it hurt him early. Who knows? But I normally talk to Rod about two and a half hours before the game. Seven o'clock game, about 4.30. I talk to Rod usually outside the locker room. And he said, yeah, at some point we're going to get to Gensel and Ajo. But right now, I don't want to mess up m- more than one line. So he had Gensel playing with Kuznetsov and Natchez. And that was fine. And then in the, during the game in Toronto... They were kind of trash. So midway through the second period, he went to what, in my mind, he was always going to get to. And that was, and we didn't we didn't know the other winger there, but because Tavo Teravainen is out, it becomes Aho with Gensel and Jarvis, which for my money, that's the way to go. Tavo Teravainen, as good as he is, and as much as he and Sebastian share a brain, he'd be fine there. I think the way Jarvis plays complements that trio better. And boy, the way they look great tonight. Again, that line was dominant tonight. So always thought that they would get to that. And to me, Svechnikov, Kuznetsov, and Natchez makes the most sense. And this, I'm not going to try to be uh, mean towards Andre. They need a lot more from him than they got tonight. But I'm not sure the the winger matters, that that winger matters. But I'm not sure that Natchez and Kuznetsov were not essentially made to play with one another. That looks like such a natural fit. It is incredible to watch. And when Kuznetsov and Natchez play the way they played tonight, which was really good, then I'm not as concerned. I thought the puck management in Ottawa and even a little bit in Toronto left a lot to be desired. But when they are valuing the puck, and even against Ottawa, there were moments where they did value the puck, and it led to the Orloff goal. I talked to Tripp about that in the pregame show. That was the Kuznetsov, Natchez, and Svechnikov line uh, that was keeping the puck in, Chatfield and Orloff with them. And when they do that, when they do their, you know, Harlem Globetrotter magic circle stuff, and they keep the puck for extended periods, it's just something to watch. But so, but that line is going to have its moments where it's going to make you pull your hair out. See, look at my lack of hair. But when they're doing it right, man, that line is going to be awesome. Now they just need Andre to help out. I thought Andre struggled with the puck tonight. I thought he was uh, his decision making was not always sharp, and I thought he kind of gave up on the play on the one that ultimately was the goal. Because if he's skating hard, then maybe Kyle Palmieri at least has a body to go through to score that goal. If, if Svechnikov is skating hard below the blue line, he might have been able to come back and, and nullify the play, but he didn't. And Brent Burns didn't play that uh, either uh, very well because it was his 
uh, pinch that allowed the puck in. Um, he should have probably backed off. But Andre needed to come back. And ultimately, you left Jacob Slavin alone. Slavin almost denied the goal. Uh, Kachetkov made a good save, but uh, rebound was there for Kyle Palmieri, and that was it. That was the one goal for the Islanders tonight. Uh, earlier in the game, the Islanders had plenty of chances, and I want to go through these real quick because I thought in the first period, first 12 minutes, I mean, New York probably had four, I mean, grade A scoring chances. Brady Shea gets a stick, lifts the stick on uh, Jean-Gabriel Pajot. That's probably a goal. Shea lifts the stick. Chatfield from behind on Bo Horvat knocks the puck away. Now, there was still an opportunity for a shot, and Kachetkov had to make a really good save, but two great defensive plays, one by Shea, one by Chatfield. By the way, I thought Brett Pesci in the first 10 minutes really was on the struggle bus, but I think he recovered and played a very good game because uh, it was Pesci's... I don't know if turnover is the right word, but T Pesci's misplay that allowed the chance for Peugeot. Uh, and again, I had written down, I make notes as we go on in the period. New York better through the first eight minutes. I extend that to 10 minutes. Nate just takes a penalty. Not a great penalty, but Carolina kills that penalty off. Great kill. Kachetkov makes a good save after the power play expired. But I don't know that that didn't ultimately get Carolina going. And then Jarvis in front, Shea takes the shot, doesn't get through, puck falls to Jarvis, and before Sorokin could get solid, Jarvis kind of swept it in between the pads. It went off the inside of Sorokin's leg and in. That made it one nothing. Two minutes later, I mean, Jarvis and Gensel with just absolute gorgeous hockey uh, the beautiful game, for those of you who are football fans, uh, makes it 2-0. Uh, and then the backbreaker, for me, the backbreaking goal of the game, if you're an Islander fan, is Carolina's on the power play. You know their power play looks like it got better. For a while it was struggling, but it looks like it's getting better. The first 90 seconds of it was pretty good. And then Carolina gets the puck behind their own net. Shea gives it to Kuznetsov. He skates it up ice. He gets it to Natchez just outside the blue line. He carries it in, and everybody just backs away. How do you allow that if you're the Islanders? I mean, maybe Natchez is mesmerizing to them too. But an absolutely wicked, wicked shot. Let me tell you a little bit, a little story about Martin Natchez. One, uh, my own opinion, and the other, simply data. Here's the data. 26 games since returning from his injury. 13 goals, 9 assists, plus 8. A little bit physical. Delivered a big hit in the game, uh, you know, the game Sunday in Ottawa. This, I keep saying it. I actually said it to Eric Tulski. <laughs> uh, this is the nature you got to pay. This is the nature you need to keep. Now, we're not there yet. We still have 13 regular season games left. We still have, have however many playoff games left. But first half of the year, Natchez was the guy. Yeah, we'll, just, we'll see where it goes. But likely going to trade him in the offseason, let somebody else pay him. But this Natchez, this Natchez, you keep. You absolutely keep. And then you also sign Jarvis. And then for next year, you've got, as I get too far ahead of myself, Aho and Jarvis and Svechnikov, hopefully the, great, the, the best version of him, and Kuznetsov and Natchez. And that's pretty good. All right? Just kind of thinking out loud here. But this Natchez is the guy you got to keep. Too dynamic to let go. Would you, uh, I'll just ask the question this way. Would you want to play against him at this point? And the answer is no. <laughs> I would not want to play against him at this point. So this is the line that I think Rod thought about at the beginning of this whole 
uh, endeavor, adding Gensel and Kuznetsov to the mix. And it does two things for me. And I think it probably does something for the head coach. And this is not to say that Stahl, Martinuk, and Jarvis wasn't a good line, because it was. But for what that line needs to be, Stahl, Martinuk, and Faust is much better. For what it needs to be, that line needs to be a shutdown line where, you, especially on home ice, you throw them out against the other team's maybe not top line. It depends on uh, foot speed. But given the right matchup, you let that line go out and swallow them whole. They're not worried about scoring goals. All they're worried about is keeping you in your defensive end. And Stahl, Martinuk, and Faust do that better than maybe any line in hockey. Don't worry about the goals. You don't need them to score in the postseason. They'll probably get some goals. Martinuk scored how many in the postseason last year? Wasn't like Martinuk was playing on a top line. So don't worry about it. Let them go do their thing. And you put Jarvis in a scoring role, but now with the mindset, he's used to playing that way, and let him be the bulldog. Let him be the guy who goes in and annoys the living Schnikes, John Butchergross, out of the opposition because he'll play that way. Uh, all right, so that's top line and what it does by getting Fost with Stahl and Martinuk. Now, I mentioned that already Kuznetsov and Natchez absolutely look like they belong together, maybe from birth, from in the womb. There were probably five passes tonight. Both ways, because I thought Natchez was just as good setting up Kuznetsov. But the little slip pass early in the second period where Kuznetsov passes it ahead, not only did he have to saucer it to get it through the defense, but it's the perfect weight. And Natchez, I mean, it goes off the, uh, off the outside of the post. He beats Sorokin. It just goes off the outside of the post. Um, but just an incredible little quick, deft touch. And to watch Kuznetsov play is just an absolute joy at this point. And that's where I want to go with him because th there's no mystery. I was listening to an interview on Sirius from a guy who covers the Capitals. And he was talking about when Kuznetsov was feeling good about himself, when he was happy in his surroundings. He was just an electric player. And two things. He knows that one of his closest friends, Dmitry Orlov, is going to be here next year. He knows. He loves being with Orlov. And I do think, yes, it's a Russian thing, but I do think he'll develop that kind of a relationship with Andre. And maybe even Piotr, for all we know. Piotr's goalies are all weird. But the, the way Kuznetsov has appeared to me is somebody who is absolutely loving the new start. And I asked him specifically, I asked him, you said last chance. And he said, what I mean is, this is my last chance to prove that I am a top player. I am still a top player. And then I talked to him about playing with Natchez, and it was a line he had used before, but he goes, I want to make him the big bucks. And he comes off, and again, the smallest of sample sizes, but he comes off to me like a guy who is a great teammate, that he cares about the people he is playing with. And if we're talking about that Yevgeny Kuznetsov, it's utterly criminal that Carolina got him for nothing. I mean, not nothing. What, a third pick, third round pick next year. And you got Washington to play half, pay half the freight. So that's your number two center for next year at $3.9 million? That's, that's pretty amazing. All right, again, that's maybe pie in the sky, but 
for right now, it looks like everything is working out as Don Waddell and Tom Dundon and Eric Tulski had hoped. And when you add Kuznetsov to the team, who is, by the way, a better defender, I think, at least that I've seen, because I thought he and Natchez were really good defensively tonight. It just makes, my gosh, it makes your entire team so much better. Uh, I'm probably shorting Jake Gensel here, but I thought after the, the trade deadline was over, I'm like, no, this is going to sound weird, but I think the more impactful deal for Carolina will be Kuznetsov because this is the way I look at it. When you insert Gensel into your lineup, you're inserting him for Michael Bunting. And I didn't think it was that big of an upgrade over Bunting. I was wrong. Gensel plays the game at an advanced level. But Michael Bunding's a very good player. Make no mistake. And they're different players. But Gensel plays the game at an advanced level. And here's who he reminds me of, although their styles are not the same, but the way they think the game is. He reminds me of Justin Williams. And you put that brain on your on the ice, you just get better in a lot of different ways. He's also a very good defender. Michael Bunting struggled in that department. But I thought Kuznetsov, because of the upgrade over, theoretically, Jesperi Kotkaniemi as one of your centers, because what you're doing now is you're putting, rather than having Drury as your, again, I'll always refer to it as this. Carolina's got three scoring lines and the stall line. Rather than having Drury as your second center, and I said many, many weeks ago, my concern about this team was going into the playoffs with Jack Drury as a second line center. And I didn't think that that was conducive to a long playoff run. You could probably win two rounds, right? I guess that's a long playoff run. You could probably get to the conference finals. But you ultimately weren't going to get to the Stanley Cup finals or win that with Drury as your number two center. But now he's not. When he comes back, he'll center your third scoring line. And if I was going to guess, I would say it would be Teravainen on the right uh, or Nason on the right, Teravainen on the left, although they're interchangeable. Because now you're going Aho, Kuznetsov, Drury, Stahl. That's as good as there is. It's as good as there is in the entire league. Um, two more things, and then we'll uh, we'll fly. First, uh, some good numbers recently. Last three games, Sebastian Aho, two goals, five assists. He is was also winning like sixty percent of his faceoffs every game. It seems uh, Seth Jarvis has five goals in a four-game goal streak. I mentioned the nature stuff. Jake Gensel so, since his arrival, two goals, six assists. Uh, he's a plus eight. So, no, I'm sorry, plus six. Eight points and a plus six. He has, uh, Kuznetsov, two goals, three assists. He's a plus four. Thought I'd throw those in there. More numbers. Last three games, power play is four of nine. I mean, we could be alarmed that they're not getting many power plays, one each way today, but I didn't think that there was a lot let go. I thought they essentially, I thought both teams played it pretty straight. And I know there were some calls maybe that they could have made, but I'm kind of glad they didn't both ways. But the game had a lot more flow at five on five. Uh, Carolina last eight games, 24 out of 24 on the penalty kill. It's probably what won them the game in Toronto, what gave them the chance. Um, their penalty kill is elite. I mean, it's beyond elite. Just one for one tonight, but 24 out of its last 24. Defensively, Brady Shea was great. Great, great tonight. Their best defenseman. Uh, I thought Jalen Chatfield was excellent tonight. Jacob Slavin was as he always is, even though he's a minus one. Uh, that goal was more than anything the product of maybe a poor decision by Brent Burns, who I thought was otherwise good, although with the net empty, with New York's net empty, he has the puck on a stick. It has to get out. The Islanders kept it in. At six on five, actually generated a couple of scoring chances. Fortunately, Kachetkov made one save, and then one puck was either blocked or went wide, and then Carolina got it out. Jarvis makes a play inside the blue line. Ajo gets the puck to Gensel, and Carolina puts it away. Uh, but Slade was really good. Burns was really good. But to me, Brady, rather, 
Brett Pesci got better after a slow start, but 76 was dynamite tonight. And Orloff and Chatfield have become, there's not a better third pair on defense in the league. I mean, I want to see, I want to see Vegas again, the way they're spread out with Hannafin arguably playing on a third pair, I think, but that's what they expected him to do. But Vegas is up there. Uh, man, the West is going to be fun to watch in the playoffs. Uh, and then finally, Pyotr Kachekov, uh, in two starts, had a 775 save percentage against the Islanders this year. 775. He was 29 out of 30 tonight. And, I mean, I haven't run the numbers because I don't want to, I just didn't have time to add them up. But I've done this this much because I've done the numbers on natural stat trick. How do you want to measure whether or not a goalie is good? Goals against average is probably not fair, right? But let's just use it as a base, as a simpleton stat. His goals against average since that Ottawa game, December 12th. Again, that's the line of demarcation for everything. Since that Ottawa game, his save percentage, rather his uh, goals against average, is right around two. Third best in the NHL. Since that game, his save percentage is about 930. It's best in the league. His goal, yeah, best in the league since December 12th. Number one in the league. Goal saved above average, which is a stat which basically says, you know, zero would be mid, would be like, yeah, the goals that should have gone in went in. The goals that shouldn't have gone in didn't go in. He is at about... 19, it's a cumulative stat, since December 12th, that's third best in the NHL. He hasn't played as much as some of the other goalies. And again, it's a cumulative stat. But it's still, he's been third best in that category. And high danger save percentage, since December 12th, best in the NHL. By any measure, Kachetkov has played like a top three goalie. Or if you want to be more conservative, a top five goalie. And now you throw Frederick Anderson back in the mix. As and I've said this, I think Anderson is the insurance policy. I think push comes to shove. All things being equal, when we get to game one of the playoffs, I think 52 has the net. And I think Rod uses Anderson as he did last year, which is... In case of emergency, break glass. Personally, I think they're going to use them both. I don't think they're going to let one guy go the distance. I just don't unless that guy continues to stand on his head. But that's not what this team needs. This team just needs solid. Just be solid. All right, I will close on this, although I think I already said I will close on this, maybe twice. If you were watching it on ESPN, as because if you have internet-based television, as I do as a YouTube TV household, you're delayed by about 40 seconds. I would have rather listened to Trip and Shane for the entirety. I usually listen to the last two minutes of each period. And then if, they, if something happens, I can lean in and... Uh, and look on the uh, television to see what it what actually happened. That's how I saw the Natchez goal. I heard it first, and then I watched it. They were a little over the top in praising Carolina. It it actually made me uncomfortable. And I got a text from a friend of ours, not just mine, a friend of ours, who compared the Islander, the, rather the Hurricanes, to the 1980 Islanders, <laughs> which. Uh, as a kid who grew up watching the Islanders, I get it. But anyway, um, the Hurricanes have room to get better. They just do. Andre Svechnikov needs to play better. Right? The goaltending needs to continue to look as it has looked. There's plenty of room for this team to get better. And there is still this little matter of Carolina's still not a huge team. They're still not a real physical team. 
They can certainly throw the body around, but it's not really their DNA. Their DNA is skating and pressure and tenacity. But sometimes you can get bullied. And at times they got bullied by Florida last year. The Islanders clearly tried to intimidate them last year as well in the playoffs. You might have to go through the Rangers, and the Rangers are going to try to do the same thing, especially if Matt Rempe is in. Uh, we all know what Jacob Troub is about. So they're not a perfect team. Not even close to that. I thought uh, Bob was choosing more so than Kevin Weeks. I thought Bob was choosing was a little over the top. Where's the weakness on this team? I'm like, yeah, there's some weaknesses. They have some puck management issues that they have to overcome sometimes. But it's it's easily the best team that Rod's had to coach. And I do think it's the most offensively gifted team that the Hurricanes have had kind of ever. That doesn't mean you're going to win. That 2016 won for a lot of reasons that go beyond talent. There was plenty of talent. This blue line is significantly better than that blue line, but that blue line had cojones all over the place. This blue line is really good. It's a little different than that one. Um, I thought that one played a little edgier than this one. Wouldn't still wouldn't mind to see a little bit more edge out of this group, but you are who you are. But Bob Wushusen was a little bit over the top. Uh, all right, that'll do it for ours, for us, whatever I just tried to say. Um, I am Adam Gold. This has been the Canes Corner Podcast. Like us, subscribe, caress the whatever button you have to push. Yeah. Be gentle with that button. I apologize. Uh, also, if you're experiencing this through regular podcast means, that's okay too. But always know that we're live on YouTube, usually about 40 minutes after every game. About 40 minutes, give or take, right? If I can get to it sooner, I will. Sometimes a little bit later, that, that happens. Uh, but go to YouTube.com, search Kane's Corner Podcast. There it is. And again, wherever you get your podcast. Uh, subscribe to it, like us, follow us, whatever the vernacular is, please do it. Uh, and you can always hit me up on Twitter at a gold fan. And I am happy to have this conversation with you. Um, it's pretty good night Four one hurricanes, just two points off the metropolitan division lead. We'll see everybody Thursday when the Canes host the flyers at PNC arena. Now we're one offs. Home away, home away, home away for like the next week and a half. Should be interesting. Evgeny Kuznetsov be going back to Washington. So will Dmitry Orlov on Friday. And then next week, Jake Gensel gets to go back to Pittsburgh. Should be emotional. Uh, we'll talk about it all right here on the Canes Corner Podcast, brought to you by the Aluminum Company of North Carolina. If it's for the exterior of your home, find it there. Sammy Hanners could do a great job. Check them out, aluminumcompany.com. Until Thursday, see you.